Welcome to the Real Estate Tax Tips channel. My name is Cherry Chen, a Chartered Professional Accountant located in Oakville, Ontario, Canada. And I'm on a mission to become the Google Map for hardworking Canadians seeking financial freedom. Today, I have a very special guest uh, here with me. As you, some of you know, a lot of uh, us are looking into buying in the United States, at least from a real estate investment perspective. Um, uh, actually, a uh, few people talk about the tax implication as a U.S. citizen. Even though you are not living in the U.S., uh, you still have some of the U.S. tax obligation that people do not talk about. So today I have Alex here, Alex Marino, uh, coming all the way from Calgary. That's why we're doing all these interviews online. And um, uh, I'm hoping to get Alex to talk about this particular topic because a few of my clients are being affected by this and being caught by this and they don't know where to start and what to look at. And welcome, Alex. Oh, welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes, Alex, I know you're a tax lawyer, so I want you to introduce yourself because tax lawyer, there's a, a lot of letters after your name, <laughs> and I know that you graduated in the U.S. and you are now living in Calgary. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. So I'm uh, one of the partners at Moody's Tax Law. We have offices in Calgary, Edmonton, and Toronto. I'm based out of our Calgary office, and I'm, uh, I'm a U.S. citizen only myself, sharing mm -hmm. in a lot of the same double tax problems that probably many of your viewers are if they're US persons living outside the United States. But yes, to your question, uh, undergrad in the United States, uh, JD, then LLM in tax after that. Uh, and I'm licensed in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. So I'm a US tax lawyer through and through. And that's the model here at Moody's. We have US lawyers, US accountants, Canadian lawyers, Canadian accountants. We don't believe in the model of uh, you know, either way, either a U.S. person trying to force gump their way through Canadian tax law or a Canadian trying to sort of find their way through the U.S. side. You need people who specialize in both. Absolutely. Um, I This question I already asked you before, I never got the answer, is why why Calgary? There are so many cities. Uh, why did you decide to leave the U.S. and come to Canada to begin with? Yeah, so Moody's Tax Law was a firm that was founded by Kim Moody, who is one of the foremost names in tax this country has ever seen. Um, you can very easily Google his name and, and see those credentials. And he started this firm 20, 30 years ago. And the flagship office is where he is, which, of course, he's an Alberta guy, is based mm -hmm. out of Calgary. Um, but yes, again, we've had offices in Vancouver before. We have offices in Toronto, Edmonton. But uh, at the time, and I often joke, the reason I'm out in the Calgary office is when I came up here from the United States in 2011, uh, you know, the Canadian dollar was booming, oil and gas here was going crazy, and the U.S. was in the middle of the, one of its greatest depressions of all time. The Canadian dollar was worth four, five, six cents more than the U.S. dollar, and uh, Alberta was a, was a different place. It is slowly coming back, for sure. Absolutely. It's been a rough 10 years, but I think it's definitely on the up, up and up. Yeah, up and up. Yeah. If you are into real estate, like a lot of our subscribers and like and invest in the Alberta market, you've seen you would have seen quite a bit of uptake in the last probably last two years. Because in, in Toronto subway uh, line, they actually provide like have an advertisement on come to uh, Alberta or something. Alberta welcomes you or something like that. Absolutely. We've got a lot of, I mean, with the oil and gas industry coming back, as well as a lot of individuals leaving Ontario, leaving BC, it's amazing what you can, in my opinion, you know, a one bedroom apartment uh, in Toronto <laughs> for a million six gets you here in Alberta. Oh, absolutely. Now, I know you also specialize, actually, it's one of um, your specialization is to handle something called US citizenship renunciation. And I have a hard time understanding it. And that's why we have you here. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about why we have to, like if you are a US citizen to begin with, what kind of tax obligation do you have first? Yeah, so our firm and myself, I run the largest renunciation practice group in the world. So I have mm -hmm. anywhere from about nine to 1300 people across six continents properly give up their US citizenship. Uh, as well as their U.S. green card status. And the reason for that is the United States is one of two countries in the world 
that taxes on citizenship. Uh, the other is Eritrea, which is a small East African country. And, and what does that mean? Taxing on citizenship means that if you're an American, no matter where you live in the world, every dollar, euro, peso, pound you ever make is subject to tax. Every other first, second, or third world country taxes on residency, which means if you live somewhere and you're a tax resident, your worldwide assets get taxed and you have to file returns and, of course, pay tax. The United States has residency-based taxation, but they also have citizen-based taxation, which means whether you're born and raised in Texas and never left, or you were just happened to be born in Ontario to a U.S. citizen mom who made you American and have never stepped foot on U.S. soil your entire life, you are taxed the exact same way. The Internal Revenue Code is not subjugated or broken up to tax on citizens, but... I've never lived there. Tax on citizens, but I don't have a passport. Tax on citizens, but I, I haven't worked there. I don't have a social security number. So unfortunately, due to that taxation system, when you live abroad as a U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. that means you're double taxed. That means if you're a U.S. citizen living in Australia, Canada, the U.K., anywhere outside the United States, you're taxed residency based wise by the country of which you live in. Yeah. and also taxed by the United States. And as I always jokingly tell people, being, being taxed by one country is a whole lot better than being taxed by two every single time. So what we do Absolutely. is we help people navigate those landmines to get one of the hands out of your cookie jar, right? Whether it's the country you're living in mm -hmm. or the US. And for most, they're not going to up and leave the country they're living in. So we have to properly get the US out. So like, can we use a super simple example um, sure. uh, to walk through this? Like, let's say I do actually have a client who was born to a U.S. citizen mom. And just thinking, I guess the mom was really thinking, hey, like, if I if my daughter ever wanted to 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 go to the States for school, there go to work there, there is a US citizenship without really thinking, considering all the tax implication. And and she has that citizenship. And what does that really mean? She's never stepped, I mean, she might have visited the US a couple of times, but I wouldn't say she's ever worked there. She's never worked there. She's never really lived there. So what are her obligations? She has a job here and she yeah. owns a couple of rental properties. Yeah, and this is the issue, right? I always say this and I, I say it as lovingly as I can, but mm -hmm. anytime somebody says I'm a US citizen, but I stop listening. And so does the IRS. All right. I'm a okay. U.S. citizen, but all my income's in Canada. I'm a U.S. citizen, but I've never gone there. I'm a U.S. citizen, but yeah. the U.S., there is no such thing as U.S. citizen light. Mm -hmm. You're either a U.S. citizen subject to the Internal Revenue Code, all regulations and rules that are as tall as I am, mm -hmm. or you're not. So anybody, you know, like I said, whether you live there your whole life or you just happen to be born to an American or some of our poor Canadians, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution says if you're born on U.S. soil, you're a U.S. citizen, period. Mm -hmm. And maybe the closest hospital happened to be in Maine instead of Quebec. And you were there for all of two hours. Well, mm -hmm. you are under the same tax. So what we need to do in the situation of your friend is your friend should have been, almost certainly mm -hmm. sounds like they haven't been, filing yeah. U.S. tax returns. We need to yeah. go into an amnesty program, avoid $10,000 penalties for non-filing of forms, get full abatement of the penalties, get them U.S. tax compliant in a three or five year submission into streamline relief procedure, all while at the same time, almost certainly renouncing the citizenship to stop the double taxation for however many years they have left of life. Mm -hmm. Because people always say, okay, under that theory, you're telling me that if I go to work here in Canada as a U.S. citizen like me, mm -hmm. or I'm collecting rental income from my property in Ontario, or I sell my principal residence, you're telling me that that's subject to tax by the U.S. and the country I'm living in? Yes. Luckily, there's a tax treaty between the U.S. and Canada. So mm -hmm. to use a, a, an easy example... Uh, I'm a U.S. citizen. I come here. I'm, let's say I make a hundred bucks. Go to work. I get a hundred bucks. U.S. is going to tax me, and so is Canada. So is the CRA. Why? I'm a resident of Canada. I'm a citizen of the U.S. Canadian. No one's ever moved to Canada for the low taxes or the weather. So the Canadian rates are normally higher. 
right? Mm -hmm. So the CRA is going to say, I want 35 bucks of that 100, Alex, because you live in Canada. I'm going to say, okay, CRA, here's the 35. Then Uncle Sam's going to come in and say, remember that time, Alex, you were born in Pennsylvania and you're a U.S. citizen? I want 25. Do I owe 60? Technically, I do. But there's a tax, to me, there's a tax treaty that says, hey, you'll never be double taxed. So what happens, or you never pay tax twice to, to two countries on the same income. So what happens is I take the 35 that I've paid to Canada and I offset dollar per dollar. I still owe the US 25, mm -hmm. but I have a credit. Now the problem happens, or the treaty doesn't help you, is when the US taxes, but Canada doesn't. Go ahead and mm -hmm. sell your principal residence for a gain of more than 250000 and Uncle Sam will come calling for 20 to 44.6% of every dollar. Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the U, former prime minister of the UK, got absolutely nailed for hundreds of thousands because he didn't renounce before he sold his principal residence and owed oh. two, three, four hundred thousand pounds in tax to the US because. When Canada doesn't tax you, say you bought that home in Toronto for $300,000, and now someone wants to buy it 30 years later for $2.3 million, but you're a U.S. citizen, Canada says, congratulations, you made $2 million a gain, but our principal residence exemption makes it tax-free. The U.S. says we exempt the first two fifty. dollars So on that $2 million a gain, we'll exempt the first two fifty dollars U.S., which is about three hundred and change Canadian. And then Uncle Sam comes calling for about 20% of 1.7 million. Oh, wow. Like people really need to pay attention to it. Now, usually at this point, I'm just visualizing, imagining what people would ask me. And I'm sure you get the same question all the time. So how do they find out? How do they, like, what are my risks? What are my chances? They haven't taught me, uh, caught up to me for the last 35 years. What are right. my odds? Very good question. So one of the most common questions I have when someone realizes, oh my goodness, this is how the US taxes. These are the, the issues we're facing, both in life and in death. We haven't even talked about the cost to file every year, yep. double tax on PFIG, CFC, 3.8% mm -hmm. Obamacare tax, God help you if you're incorporated, a non-US partnership trust, and US death tax. And they say, mm -hmm. oh geez, I owe all these penalties for not filing. There are amnesty programs to get into to make those penalties zero if you go to them before they find me. But before they start looking to fix the problem, the human, the basic, very common human question is, okay, yep. I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, but will I get caught? And if so, how? And once I get caught, if that day comes, mm -hmm. how can they make me pay? Those are the two most common questions when you're breaking <laughs> a rule. Yeah. Will they catch me? And if they catch me, what's the penalty? So to your mm -hmm. first question, you will get caught. And anybody who thinks that otherwise needs to Google FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, F-A-T-C-A. Mm -hmm. The Canada, along with 190 plus other countries under the Obama administration, signed an agreement that says all non-U.S. banks have an affirmative obligation to find out who their U.S. citizen depositors are and turn over those names, accounts of suspected U.S. persons every year to the IRS for the IRS to come find you. And every year here in Canada, there's somewhere to the tune of, and it fluctuates, but there are hundreds of thousands of accounts and persons that are turned over to the IRS. And Joe Biden and the Democrats recently passed last year, the Inflation Reduction Act, which mm -hmm. gave the IRS an extra $80 billion on top of their current budget and 87,000 new IRS agents to go through that data to make what they estimated, it was a wild number of six or seven trillion to find non-compliant US persons and make wow. them pay. So what we have is FATCA, which you can easily Google. Mm -hmm. And it's probably why many of your US clients get asked by their banks, are you an American? What's your tax citizenship? It's now why people at the border, when you cross the border with a Canadian passport that says born in Massachusetts, the customs agents say, welcome home, go get a US passport. They're flagging oh. you for tax. So what you'll find is, am I going to get caught? Almost certainly. If you've got a U.S. place of birth, if you've ever had a U.S. passport or social security number or birth abroad, you're hooped. It's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And you want to go to them before they find you. 
because we can get the penalties waived properly renounced and make it all go away. The difference between Boris Johnson and what many clients should do that we work with is we'll renounce the citizenship before you sell the house. Mm -hmm. And if you renounce it the right way and avoid an exit tax, which we will, mm -hmm. you'll sell the house the day after the interview at the consulate to renounce, and he would have saved hundreds of thousands, but he didn't. So how will they catch us? FATCA, the border, information sharing agreements, CRA, which is common reporting standards, which was all the other first world countries, including Canada, saying, oh, my God, FATCA is a wonderful idea. Give Obama credit. The U.S. set up a system that said we're not going to spend a dollar and every other country of the world is going to find our citizens for us to sit back and collect checks. Diabolically successful. And with that, and then the next question is, if they do find you, when that day will come? Mm -hmm. What if you do what Boris Johnson did at the beginning and say, I'm not going to pay you? So when Boris got hit... And the media picked up on the fact, because Boris was born in New York. Yep. And they said, Boris, you owe hundreds of thousands to the IRS. And Boris said, that's ridiculous. I, have to, I left the U.S. at age four. I sold a British property in London, not a place in New York. I'm not paying them a red pence, one single penny. And when you tell the IRS you're not going to pay them their money, things don't go well for you. So when you are flagged, there's really three problems with telling the IRS you're not going to pay them. Number one, I would never go back to the United States because now is the first time over the last four or five years where both countries have a new information sharing agreement. And as of a couple of years ago, there's about 600,000 names where the IRS is corresponding with immigration, State Department, USCIS to flag people crossing the border who owe them money. Now, so I would never go back to the United States again if I were you. Number two, do they have the authority to come to Canada and put a lien on your assets here, which would be just for not filing? Even if you didn't owe money on the returns, you would owe hundreds of thousands in failure to file penalties. And no, they don't. But if you have U.S. stocks, U.S. bonds, or U.S. real estate, they can take that immediately. That's within their mm -hmm. jurisdiction. And then lastly... If you're never going to go to the U.S., you have no desire to go to Disneyland again, you have no U.S. site as property, can you die your way out of the problem? No. Uncle Sam will be sending you letters owing hundreds of thousands in penalties alone, which will continue to compound. When you die, you're leaving your family in a very difficult position, which is your family members will then have to decide whether they should pay the IRS out of your estate, even if it means making the, the estate bankrupt. The IRS gets paid first. And if they don't pay them, all of the beneficiaries and the executor become you. So now the IRS mm -hmm. is going to chase your children and loved ones at mm -hmm. three times the amount because you didn't pay it. And as I always jokingly say, when the IRS sat there in 2010 and passed one of the most diabolically successful pieces of legislation to find non-tax compliant persons in FATCA, the two things they sat down to say were, how do we find them? And when we find them, how do we make them pay? And if either of one of those weren't successful in its application, you wouldn't have 10, 12, 14, 18 month wait times to renounce here in Canada. At one point, the wait time to give up your US citizenship, pay a government fee, legal fees, to hand in one of the most coveted passports the world has ever known was two and a half to three years. Wow. And then during that waiting period, you still have to continue to file your returns, right? Exactly. Unfortunately, Canada, of all the countries in the world, and this is where we can forum shop. So of the eight and a half million estimated U.S. citizens living outside the United States, Canada has the most by far. And that is somewhere to the tune of about 1.8 to two and a half. It depends. Two million is usually... What we're looking at you can throw a stone down the street in toronto and hit three americans um and so what happens is uh, you know obviously there are a lot here in canada the wait times being so long demand being so high to renounce and stop this bleeding that we can actually forum shop i have a list of six broken up by continent country and wait time if i've got somebody selling their home or their business facing massive u.s tax liability and they don't have 18 months to wait for an interview to renounce in Toronto, mm -hmm. I could fly them to Florence, Frankfurt, Jamaica, 
Mexico City, Rio, South Africa, Auckland, Australia. We're renouncing clients all over the world, Aussies, Kiwis, Brits, Canadians, so we can forum shop to get a quicker date. But yes, to your point, um, that is the problem. And what this is, U.S. citizen-based taxation has been around since the War of 1812. Nothing new in the law. People go, well, when did this change? It didn't. It's been around your whole life. Look in the back of your U.S. passport, and they'll cite the code section that says you owe money no matter where you go. Oh, really? Correct. What has changed is the IRS can now find you, FATCA. And for years, individuals, mainly here in Canada, there's a couple of crazy groups online who I've told people do not listen to for a decade plus now said, we're going to fight the fight. FATCA is unconstitutional. Well, July of 2023, the U.S. Supreme Court finally got the case in front of them. Whether FATCA is constitutional for non-US financial Canadian institutions to turn over your sensitive information to the IRS. And the US, excuse me, the Canadian Supreme Court said, this challenge is so stupid that we're not even gonna hear the case, that we're not even gonna waste our time, our breath and the ink on paper. We're denying it before we hear it and it's unappealable. And oh, we've been wow. telling clients that for a decade. Your money is much better spent than a couple of non-US lawyers online telling you a load of you know what, that they're going to fight the good fight against the IRS and win. You're not. Your best bet is to get compliant, renounce, or if you don't want to, you need to accept the fact that there are expensive tax returns that need to be filed in two countries every year at thousands of dollars, double tax risks. You shouldn't have real estate. You shouldn't have TFSAs. You shouldn't have Canadian companies. You shouldn't have partnerships, trusts. There is no 3.8% Obamacare tax. Hell, if you win the lottery, had a poor guy win a nice size lottery, tax-free in Canada, guess where it's not tax-free if you're an American? Mm. And then of course the US has an estate tax. And we could yep. go on for a long time about their estate tax, not matching the death tax here in Canada. That, that is not very encouraging. And I can feel that the energy is just like, oh my God, and it's going down and down and down. So where's the hope? The hope is to renounce your, your US citizenship, right? That is the only thing that we can do or like the clients can do. I don't, but I wasn't born there. I wasn't born to any US citizenship, uh, citizen uh, parents. So I'm good. But for people who are not good, um, what can they do? And at the beginning, you also mentioned that this could also affect uh, the green card holder. So they're not technically US citizen. So how does, how do this all come together? What are the green card holder tax filing no. obligation that would also affect them? Because I'm sure there are a bunch of people that are also, that have that um, green card and they're just like, oh, I'm holding it just in case. Right. right. We run the largest expatriation group in the world. And when you hear the term expatriation, it should be broken up into two subcategories, citizens renouncing and green card holders terminating. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, green card holders are taxed the same way as citizens in almost every aspect. Ooh, so when wow. you got a green card and you went back home and didn't properly terminate it, that's a problem. You're in the same soup as the citizen. And in fact, mm -hmm. what we need to do is go into an amnesty program, backfile returns, terminate when you go and and this is where the challenge comes in and where the legal expertise is needed terminating your green card or renouncing your citizenship is not as easy as just heading down to the montreal consulate and sliding it under the door you have to if the, you don't renounce the right way the u.s will hit you with an exit tax on your entire net worth an inheritance tax for any u.s citizen children losing half at your death disbarment from the united states for life if they determine you're doing this to avoid tax under the reed amendment loss of benefits, travel restrictions. What we do for 12, 1300 people a year is we avoid those landmines along the way so that when you come out, you're treated like any other citizen. But yes, uh, again, I do webinars and, and in-person presentations in the old days before COVID in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Singapore, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, London, Paris, all over Canada where we would walk through. It's two and a half hours, three hours, where we walk through what it means to be a green card holder and citizen. How will they find you? How they tax? Mm -hmm. What we can do? How do we renounce properly? And you can get a very, very, very good result, but you have to be proactive. You have to go to them before they find you. 
that's a critical, critical component because there are amnesty programs, but you don't get amnesty for getting caught. You get amnesty for going to them first. And then, of course, on the legal side, you have to renounce the right way, which is critical, right? We don't want an exit tax. We don't want disbarment. We don't. We want to be able to renounce, still own U.S. real estate, have a social security number, keep our bank accounts, 401ks, IRA, see our family and friends down there whenever we want. Hell, you can even collect social security after we renounce you properly. Oh. So in essence, it's get rid of all the bad, which is the double tax, keep all of the good. And with that Canadian passport as your fallback passport, if you renounce properly, that's like U.S. Citizenship Junior without the tax. Wow. To the point where I could renounce you the right way. And if an amazing job opportunity came, I could have a USMCA work permit in your hand in two weeks into a green card into citizenship again. Hmm. Canadians have a very good deal. Very that sounds good. sounds way more positive <laughs> than what we were talking about before. So you mentioned about webinar, and I've seen emails about the webinar in the past. So for those people who are watching this video right now, and if they want to join your webinar, is there a cost associated with it? It's a two and a half hour webinar. It's very long. And how often do you do these webinars? Absolutely. So there is no cost. So the webinars I do, they're, they're live webinars in these studios. I'm answering live questions on a screen as they go. So um, I do usually one or two a month. And they're broken up by jurisdiction. So to give you an example, uh, in two weeks from now, not this weekend, but the next, I'll be doing that two and a half hour live webinar on renouncing citizenship and terminating green cards for individuals living in the UK, Europe, and the Middle East. Uh, two weeks ago, it was Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbeans. Uh, and then next month, it'll be Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. So it really depends on where you're going to be geographically because uh, a TFSA for a, a Canadian is a whole lot different than an, than an ISA or a SIP for a Brit or a superannuation fund for an Aussie or a Kiwi saver for a New Zealander. So we want to target the right one to where you are. Yeah. Obviously, the Canadian would be for most of the people tuning in here today. We can send a recording. So if someone yeah. reaches out and they can't make it or it's too far out, we can send a recording. You just can't ask live questions, of course. Mm -hmm. Or on our website, you, we have the, the webinar uh, link where you can book and, and register to watch the live webinar. Or again, email me and I can send the recording. That's awesome. So on that note, how do we get to that website? And I don't think getting to you is right because you seem like you're very busy because you're doing all the webinar from like, literally close to coast, all at your comfort of Calgary office, but at the same time, you're really busy. So how do we get to you? And maybe your website? Yeah. Absolutely. And again, there's a whole team. I don't want you to think I'm doing this on my own. We've got a team of about six to eight US lawyers uh, with additional, we do tax returns, we do the renunciations, we do it all. We're a one-stop shop for anything US, Canada, cross-border. We have an estates and trust group, corporate group, U.S. tax returns and Canadian returns, U.S. lawyers, Canadian lawyers. So it's not just me, obviously. There's a team of 15 to 20 people making this thing hum. Um, but yes, I would say, obviously, our website, moodystax.com, uh, uh, as well as if you want to reach out to me individually, amarino at moodystax.com. So first letter of my name, uh, and then, of course, my last name at Moody's tax.com or you can just google my name it'll come right up there are my assistant Catherine helps me triage emails she'll be able to send links respond so yes if anyone is interested by I really think the webinar is an amazing start it's two and a half hours of a crash course of everything you need to know after those webinars we set up consultations because no webinar is going to be specific enough to someone's facts we set up an hour we work through your facts. We work through how we could solve it, options. The most important thing of renouncing is we don't spend a dollar to save a quarter. Mm -hmm. We spend a dollar to save 20. It just so happens that regardless of your net worth, low, medium, high income individuals, for the fees that it would take to solve these problems, 99.999% of people are better off 
renouncing and going through the process from an economic point of view, not speaking to emotion and being taxed by one country. So please, yes, people can reach out online directly to me, Moody's, our website, webinar links on there. It's fairly user-friendly. Well, that has been a lot of information, really great value a conversation that we just had. And thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you on our channel today. And I really, really appreciate it. And I should title this webinar as like how to save taxes, double taxation, avoid double taxation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Alex. And really appreciate your time and effort. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Cherry. Thanks.